At the start of this series, I talked about two biggest barriers of preventing somebody from getting into the kingdom. The first one was religion, and I covered that pretty well. The second is riches, and I'm going to talk about that today. Oftentimes when people hear any scriptures regarding riches in the Bible, it's always they seem to think that that's for the wealthy people. When God is really saying that this is for anybody, money can be the greatest barrier to you getting into the kingdom whether you're rich or not. And so today we're just gonna go over scripture. We're just gonna read them and explain them. The truth is, is that money does bring happiness. That's why everybody chases after it. It, it brings comfort, it, it gives you power. And, and, and in some cases, um, adoration from other people because you got so much money. At the root of all this is happiness. And that's what people are going for. But the problem with happiness is it's temporal. So you get the money, you buy the product or service or the person in some cases, and then it, it, it goes away. The new product you bought, the new dress, the new, new clothing, the, 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 the new this, the new that, it goes away. It's no longer new anymore. It no longer brings you happiness. And then if you love money, it'll lead to the fear of losing it, dependency on it, because you're feeding your happiness and you got to keep buying stuff and pursuing more money to buy happiness. So you're dependent on it now. It's leading you to sin in some cases, and then it leads to the hatred of God. And we'll talk about that in the final parts of this, this uh, podcast. And then it makes you a slave to it. Like I said, dependent on it and you're a slave to it. A lot of people are working extra hours for just, they can get some more money so they can buy something extra for themselves. And they're saying, I just want to treat myself and and, and uh, buy this little thing for me, but you are slave to the money because it got you working extra now. You, you're doing things that's breaking your back. So at the end of this, this, this uh, podcast, I want you to see, or this sermon rather, I want you to see that God just wants us to look at money as a tool. It's just, just like a hammer, any other kind of tool. It's just used to buy things, but we can't love it. Because he wants us to understand that he's our provider. We talked about God being a supply for all our needs. He wants to, us to know that he's our source and that we can have joy in him. And that and joy is a lot different from happiness. Joy is not based off of circumstances or what you newly just bought or what condition you're in. You can have joy despite what's going on around you. So that's what God wants for us. He wants us to have joy. And he wants us to know that he's our provider. And so we're going to see that as we study these scriptures here. But, but if we don't settle with the fact that God wants to be our provider, that he is our only source and that money isn't in our, in our ability to acquire money, if we don't grasp that and then we go into pursuing money and loving money and pursuing happiness rather than joy, which is only found in God. Well, what's going to happen is we're just going to end up not being in the kingdom of God because that's not how the kingdom operates. God is our provider. He gives us joy. All our needs are taken care of by him. We don't generate anything. He provides for us. And so if we got we got to grasp that, that that's how the kingdom works. We've been told growing up that we got to take care of ourselves, that we generate our provision and we, we're, we're responsible for that. But no, God is our provider in that area. And I encourage you to check out the other podcasts regarding God's supply and, and things like that. So today, let's go over some scriptures and just explain them. Well, here's, the, here's what we're going to do. We're going to deal with the rich people first, because some of these scriptures are specifically talking to rich people who have a lot more than other people. And we're going to just expose what, what God is saying to them first, and then we'll talk about everybody else. Okay. So let's go to Luke chapter 16, verses 19 through 31. This is the parable of the rich man and Lazarus. Okay. I'm going to be reading from the New Living Translation. It says, Jesus said, There was a certain rich man who was splendidly clothed in purple and fine linen and who lived each day in luxury. At his gate lay a poor man named Lazarus who was covered with sores. As Lazarus lay there longing for scraps, from the rich man's table, the dogs would come and lick his open sores. Finally, the poor man died and was carried by the angels to sit beside Abraham at the heavenly banquet. The rich man also died and was buried, and he went to the place of the dead. There in torment, 
he saw Abraham in the far distance with Lazarus at his side. The rich man shouted, Father Abraham, have some pity. Send Lazarus over here to dig the, the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue. I am in anguish in these flames. But Abraham said to him, Son, remember that during your lifetime you had everything you wanted, and Lazarus had nothing. So now he is here being comforted, and you are in anguish. And besides, there is a great chasm separating us. No one can cross over to you from here, and no one can cross over to us from there. Then the man, the rich man said, Please, Father Abraham, at least send him to my father's home, for I have five brothers, and I want him to warn them so they don't end up in the place of torment. But Abraham said, Moses and the prophets have warned them. Your brothers can read what they wrote. The rich man replied, No, Father, if someone is sent to them from the dead, then they will repent of their sins and turn to God. But Abraham said, If they won't listen to Moses and the prophets, they won't be persuaded even if someone rises from the dead. So we have here a rich man and a poor man. Rich man dies, the poor man dies. The rich man goes to hell and is tormented for all eternity. And the poor man is in heaven with Abraham. And we can see just the, the, the mindset of the rich here. He's calling Abraham and saying, can you go get that man to come do something for me? He has he still has this arrogant mindset that, you know, he somebody's supposed to wait on him and take care of him. And can you can you come get him to go dip his finger in some some cool water? And because I'm, I'm just so he still has this servant. People got to serve me mindset, even in hell. He hasn't changed. But the reason why he's in hell, because the rich man knew about the poor man. And he wouldn't do anything about it. So what, what we're explaining here is that it's not wrong to be rich, but which, with your riches, you have a great responsibility. And that responsibility is to help those who are poor. You know, all this money ain't for one dude. You know, it's for everybody. It's for people who, who may need. People say, well, I work for this money and these people didn't. They're lazy. They don't know anything about financial uh, success. And so that's why they're in that condition. And so why should I help them when they didn't do the studying that I did to get to where I'm at? You know, I did this. I flipped houses. I've invested in a, in the stock market. I built my business. Why should I give anything to them when they didn't do anything? Well, they're uneducated. They didn't know any better. They're still suffering. You as a human being should see the suffering of others and do something about it. Now, you may not want to give them the money, but you can create a program to educate them on how to get money. Whatever the case, you, you ought to be doing something. But in this case, this, this guy turned a blind eye to this, this, this poor man who was also sickly. He had, you know, his sores were licked by the dogs. And he just, the man sat there begging just to get the, the scraps from the table of uh, this, the, uh, of this rich man. So, once I want to be very clear, it's not wrong to be rich. It's just what you're doing with your wealth in relation to those who are poor, you know. And we'll continue to see scriptures, what, what God requires of those who are rich. The next scripture is the parable of the rich man, the rich young ruler. This is found in Mark chapter 10, verses 17, 17 through 27. It says, as Jesus was starting out on his way to Jerusalem, a man came running up to him knelt down and asked good teacher what must i do to inherit eternal life so he's got the right spirit he wants to know how to inherit inherit eternal life verse 18 it says why do you call me good jesus asked only god is truly good but to answer your your question you know the commandments you must not murder you must not commit adultery you must not steal you must not testify falsely you must not cheat anyone honor your mother and father Teacher, the man replied, I've obeyed all these commandments since I was young. Looking at the man, Jesus felt genuine love for him. There is still one thing you haven't done, he told him. Go and sell all your possessions and give the money to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come, follow me. At this, the man's face fell, and he went away sad, for he had many possessions. Jesus looked around and said to his disciples, How hard it is for a rich for the rich to enter the kingdom of God. This amazed them, but Jesus said again, Dear children, it is very hard to enter the kingdom of God. 
In fact, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. The disciples were astounded. Then who in this world can be saved, they asked. Jesus looked at them intently and said, Humanly speaking, it is impossible, but not with God. Everything is possible with God. So I'm glad to hear that, that everything is possible with God. It's hard to get into the kingdom, but it's possible with God. So I just go over this this uh, this account here. So a rich guy comes to Jesus, says he wants to be, he wants to have eternal life. He wants to be in the kingdom. And, and Jesus, he brings up six commandments. He mentions that the way to get into the kingdom, you just, you must keep the commandments. He tells them, don't murder, don't commit adultery, don't steal, uh, don't testify falsely, don't cheat anyone, and honor your mother and father. And the, and the teacher said, the man said, teacher, I've obeyed all these commandments since I was young. So it is very well possible he, he was doing that. Now, he didn't mention the four other commandments, though. And Jesus kind of left those out for whatever reason. We're not going to get into that. But the bottom line is Jesus said, you lack one thing, and that is you got all these possessions. You need to sell them and give them to the poor. So once again, great wealth is not for you to accumulate for yourself. It's for you to distribute amongst those that, that need. And that's what he's saying to them. He said, you want to be in the kingdom, you can't have all this stuff and just, it needs to be distributed. Another thing it exposes is that this man had a lot of investment in his stuff. He, he was more attached to that than um, the things of God. So the, in order to get into the kingdom, you got to let go of your attachment to things. Once again, it's not wrong to be rich. We're not against the rich. The scriptures are not against the rich. It's just that if you are connected to them, you may be very well have to let go of the money because it could be a hold on you. In this case, the man's face fell. Here he is asking him how to get eternal life. And then the Jesus tells him and then he goes away sad. Then Jesus tells everybody, he says, look, it's hard for people who are rich to enter into the kingdom of God. It's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to get into the kingdom. So he's just saying that Riches are, are very, very, can be a very, very tough thing to let go of, and it, it, it will prevent you from getting into the kingdom if you allow it. So that's what I see in this this passage. It's a lot more to bring out of it, but he's just saying, look, you got to give this stuff up. This doesn't apply to every rich person. Every rich person doesn't hasn't invested their soul into their own riches. They haven't done that. They use them as tools to distribute and help the poor and to increase wealth and to spread it around and help others. So um, this is not applying to everybody, but and if this rich young ruler would have said, okay, Jesus, that's hard. Man, you know, I got to get all my riches up. Okay, okay, help me to do that. You know, I want to do that, but it's hard for me. And God would have worked it out in him, you know. And little by little, he probably would have got rid of those things and, and uh, helped a lot of people. And got the eternal life. Because that's what's more important. It ain't about your temporal life down here. It's about eternal life in heaven. And we'll see in scripture how how that's just more important. I hope that people who are following this series for the first time can understand it. You know, it ain't about this life. It's about the next one. There is a next life. And whether or not you're going to be in eternal damnation or in eternal uh, bliss with the Lord Jesus Christ and the rest of the saints is up to you. You know, and it's... It's about what you decide to do down here. So let's go on. This is in 1 Timothy chapter 6, verses 17, 17 through 19. It says, teach those who are rich in this world not to be proud and not to trust in their money, which is so unreliable. Their trust should be in God who, who richly gives us all we need for our enjoyment. Tell them to use their money to do good. They should be rich in good works and generous to those in need always being ready to share with others. By doing this, they will be storing up their treasure as, as good foundation for the future so that they may experience true life. So there you have it right there. That's what the riches are for. We talked about the gift of giving last time. If you're rich, that's what your riches are for, to help those who don't have. You know, the world's jacked up because there's people harboring and holding on to their money 
and their wealth and their resources. They won't spread it. They keep it all for themselves. They got a huge house. It's just them and a few other people living there. And I can hear the rich people. I know how they think. You know, I, I went to school, I learned the, the tricks of the trade. I built all this myself. That poor dude over there didn't go to school. He was lazy. He didn't do this and that. Why should I give him anything? I work for this. This is mine. He has to deal with his scraps. And we just talked about what the rich man could do if he didn't want to give that man money directly. He could create schools or things of that nature to help them. But riches is, is more about power and prestige as well. So. People want to have more than others so they can feel better than other people. And so we see here in the scripture here that uh, he says that teach those who are rich in this world not to be proud and not to trust in their money, which is unreliable. The riches brings pride. Some people want to feel like God over other people. That's why they got that money. So, of course, they don't want to give it to nobody else. They don't want to spread it out. They don't want to be equal to anybody else. So that's why they they acquire so much riches and they lord it over other people and they say, I'm better than you. You know, but the scripture is clearly saying that those who are saved, that are saints in the kingdom of God, they must be taught not to be proud and not to trust in their money. You know, money is just a tool. It's just a tool to help other people. And money is unreliable. You can have it today and it'll be gone tomorrow. Their trust should be in God, it says, who richly gives us all we need for our enjoyment. So God is our, our provider. He is the one that is uh, here for to bring us enjoyment. The word joy is in there. Once again, we're not, we're not chasing happiness through, through money, which only brings temporal happiness. We're going for the joy that's in God. And all we have to do is rest in God. So it goes on to say in verse 18, tell them to use their money to do good. They should be rich in good works and generous to those in need, always being ready to share with others. That's what it's for. Why well, should one person have all of this stuff and then everybody else doesn't have the bare essentials and you just walking around holding it? It's for other people. It's not to say that you got to go dirt poor by helping everybody else, but that's what it's for. And he says that by helping other people with your, with your resources, that this will be storing up treasure as, as a good foundation for the future so that you may have experienced true life. So you want to store up treasures in the kingdom of God, help the people in need now. That's one way of doing it. So scripture is clear about riches. Now let's move into some other passages. Ecclesiastes chapter five, verse 10. It says, those who love money will never have enough. How meaningless to think that wealth brings true happiness. This is from the great man of wisdom. If you love money, You'll never be satisfied because the more you get, it's like, man, I don't have enough. I can't go for this now. I got to get more. I, it's, 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 you're deceiving yourself if you love money. You know, and now, this, like I said, this is pertaining to, to poor people. There's people that's not rich. First Timothy chapter six, verse 10, it says, for the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. And some people craving money have wandered from the true faith and pierced themselves with many sorrows. So that's the that's the key scripture there. The love of money is the root of all evil, not money. It's the love of money. If you love it, that it will lead to you doing some evil things. And when you look at the evil in the world behind the scenes, that it was somebody that was getting paid off of that. So he just says that that's what's happening there. And as a small guy like yourself, you say, I'm not rich. I'm just a regular guy. But if you love the money and chasing it, it will lead to you doing something sinful and evil. God is saying, well, he says, some people craving money have wandered from the true faith and pierced themselves with many sorrows. So in their pursuit of money, they wandered from the faith and they pierced themselves with many sorrows. So they hurt themselves. They caused themselves to be in predicaments where they were harmed. He's saying you got to chill with this money thing. It's just a tool. You know, let God provide for your needs. Don't trust in money. Let's go to Proverbs chapter 30, verses 8 through 9. He says, first, help me never to, to tell a lie. Second, give me neither poverty nor riches. Give me just enough to satisfy my needs. For if I grow rich, I may deny you and say, who is the Lord? And if I am too poor... I may steal and thus insult God's holy name. 
And that should be a lot of our, our prayer today. Just give me enough to satisfy my needs. I don't want to be poor because I, I might it might lead me to steal something to take care of myself. And I don't want to be super rich because that might lead me to be a person that denies who, who God even is. Here's a person saying, oh, now nah, who is the Lord? This is what happened with Israel. They got all this wealth after conquering lands. God did it, helped them do it. And then they start forgetting about God. He said, don't forget me. And this is what we're riches can do for you. You got so much power. You're comfortable. You, you're able to buy this and buy that and live the way you want to live. You start forgetting about God. You think your money is, is the reason why you're in this condition. And at a moment notice that money can be gone and you back asking God, God, Lord, can you, you know, provide this and that? You don't know. He says, so we should pray this. This should be our prayer. I don't want to be rich or poor. I just want to be in the middle. I want my needs satisfied. That's it. However, once again, there are some people with the gift of giving. They may be rich. We're not against riches. We're not going to, we're not saying it's evil to be a rich person, but those resources should be used to help other people and not be hoarded for yourself. Hebrews chapter 13, verses five. It says, don't love money. Be satisfied with what you have. For God has said, I will never fail you. I will never abandon you. So we see here that the love of money will lead to you not being satisfied with what you have. So the more you have of it, the more you go and buy other stuff. And you say, you know what? I'm not satisfied because of, once again, those the, the purchases of those products and services, they only bring temporal happiness. So you're not satisfied. Now you got to go out and buy something else. And you just become unsatisfied. So he says, be satisfied with what you have. So if you are rich or you, if you're not, I'm going to be satisfied with what I got. I'm not going out and getting something else. I'm not going to let the commercials and the latest product or service or whatever lead me to pursuing it. I'm going to be content with what I have. That's how we should be thinking about when it comes to our finances. Not going out and trying to buy the latest thing. Because I can guarantee you the root behind you buying that new thing is because you're not satisfied in God. You don't have a, a root in him. And so you're going to buy that new thing to fulfill a void in your soul because you're not letting God fill you with the joy of him. So now you're pursuing happiness, which is only temporal. You keep buying new things and going after this and that. You'll never be satisfied. The scripture is clear. It's teaching us. Don't pursue money like that. Don't love money like that. Let go of that stuff. Let God take care of us. So we, we come to this, this the final scriptures here. It's in Matthew chapter 6, verses 19 through 34. It says, don't store up treasures here on earth where moths eat them and rust destroy them and where thieves break in and steal. Store your treasures in heaven where moths and rust cannot destroy and thieves do not break in and steal. Wherever your treasure is, there the desires of your heart will also be. I'll just stop right there and we'll continue reading. But I just want to break that down. All you have to see is where do you, where, what do you desire? If all your desires is, is seem to be in this particular place, that's where your, your treasures are going to be stored. So if you're thinking about the kingdom of God, pursuing that, doing the will of God, those are your desires. That's what's being transformed. If those are your desires, then that's where your treasure's at. But if you, your desires are always wrapped in the next piece of land you're going to purchase, how you're going to increase your wealth, how you're going to protect your money, how you're going to uh, work extra hours to get something, some other uh, thing you're trying to acquire, then your, your, your heart may be with, with money and treasures, and it may not be with the kingdom of God. So he, he's just showing you how to check yourself. What, what are your focuses? We need to put treasures in heaven. That means focusing on the kingdom of God, focusing on spiritual growth and transformation. And doing the will of God. Those are our focuses. It's not to say that we, we, we do other stuff. We got other stuff to do. You know, we got earthly and carnal things to do. But the main thing is, is what are our strong, what, where do our strong desires lie in? And we can check ourselves by looking at those. So it goes on to say in verses 22, your eye is like a lamp that pro provides light for your body. When your eye is healthy, your whole body is filled with light. But when your eye is unhealthy, your whole body is filled with darkness. And if the light you think you have is actually darkness, how deep 
that darkness is. Verse 24 says, No one can serve two masters, for you will hate one and love the other. You will be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and be enslaved to money. So it's, it's, it's clear. You're either going to serve God or serve money. Some people are working two to three jobs to buy a little extra stuff on the side to pursue something of theirs, and they can't, they can't serve God while they're serving money. You can't do both. So it's clear. If you love money, you can't love God at the same time. You can't serve him. You can't follow him because the money going to be like, no, you got to come over here and do this for me. You got to take up that extra job. You got to work some extra hours. You got to go pursue this property. You got to go do this. You got to go do that. And God is like, no, come over here. I need you to focus on the kingdom right now and do some things and study some scriptures and, and listen to this, this podcast and do this and that. And I want to change it. No, no, money going to pull you back and say, no, you got to go over and do this. I, got, I need you to come over here and, uh, and handle some more hours at Walmart. Okay, you got to come back down to the store and do this. So who are you serving of? You're serving the money. You can't serve God and money at the same time. So we got to make sure that money is not our Lord. You can't let it run us. I don't care if it's a job, the pursuit of protecting money, or whatever the case. We can't, we can't let it do it to us. God must be our Lord and our provider and if we're getting, like I said, if, he, if we make him our provider, if we make him the source of our joy, money can, won't have any control over us. We won't be going to money to get happiness because we got joy, which is a lot better from God. Verse 25, this is why I tell you not to worry about everyday life, whether you have enough food and drink or enough clothes to wear. Isn't life more than food and your body more than clothing? Look at the birds. They don't plant or harvest or store food in barns, for your heavenly Father feeds them. And aren't you far more valuable to him than they are? Can all your worries add a single moment to your life? So he's saying, you know, worrying doesn't, d d don't do anything. A lot of people do that. Um, he says that the birds are less valuable to God than we are. You know, he died for us. He didn't die for the birds. We're more valuable to him. So if we're more valuable to him, then he definitely cares more about us and he will take care of us. And that's what Jesus is trying to explain to these people. We don't have to be worrying about clothing and drink and food and shelter and all that kind of stuff. God will take care of us. Don't worry about these things, he said. Verse 28, it says, And why worry about your clothing? Look at the lilies of the field and how they grow. They don't work or make their, their clothing, yet Solomon in all his glory was not dressed in as beautifully as they are. And if God cares so wonderfully for wildflowers that are here today and thrown into to the fire tomorrow, he will certainly care for you. Why do you have so little faith? So he's, he's telling them, God cares for you. You know, why do you, why you don't believe that he cares? This is the truth. God loves us. You know, he, he loves these plants too, but he loves you even more. And why are you sitting up here tripping about, oh, what am I going to do? You know, why are you taking care of yourself when God wants to take care of you? Why are you putting your investment and trust in riches when God wants to take care of that? Why are you chasing happiness and money to buy happiness when God wants to give you joy? He goes on to say, verse 31, so don't worry about these things, saying, what will we eat, what will we drink, what will we wear? These things dominate the thoughts of unbelievers. But your heavenly father already knows all your needs. Seek the kingdom above all else and live righteously and he will give you everything you need. Don't worry about tomorrow for tomorrow will bring its own worries. Today's trouble is enough for today. We take days one at a time. We don't we don't focus on the rest of the the week and the month and, the, and down the line. Just focus on today. You know, there's enough things going on today. Don't allow the, the, the world and where they think they infiltrate your thoughts. He says, these are the thoughts of unbelievers. Unbelievers are always are worried about their food and their clothing and, and their money and their, their home and shelter, all that stuff. They worry about all that stuff because they don't have God to take care of them, which you do. They don't have God. So, that of course, they're going to worry. They're only able to do what they can with the resources that they have. They don't have a God to take care of them. We can't be like that. He says, those are the thoughts of the unbelievers. Do you want to be an unbeliever? A person running around worrying? Because that is what the indication is if you are a worrier. So we got to let go of worry. 
and let God take care of us and supply our needs. So that's all I have for today as far as scripture is concerned. I want to reiterate that God just wants to take care of us. Money is a, is a, a tool, that's it. If you got a lot of it, it's there to help other people. We can't fall in love with it and let it control us. Like I said, a lot of people, this is not the rich people. It's just the average Joe who says, okay, I'm not really connected to God, so I don't have joy in my soul. But happiness is something I can go for. I just seen a commercial for a new product. I want that product because that's going to bring me happiness. They work extra hours to get it. The product gives them some satisfaction for a time. That goes away. They say, okay, I want to buy something else next. They keep going after keep going after keep going after things that's what's happening we can't be like that we have to also be content with what we have he said just be content with what you got you know the more money you got the more it'll it'll entice you to go spending it spending it to buy more stuff so we got to be content with what we have and say you know what the rest of this i'm gonna just give to somebody in need i'm not about to use it on myself and because i'm content with what i have you see but a lot of Americans, we live rich, even though we, we, we may say, well, I'm on this, I'm on I'm Section 8, this, that, and the other, I'm, I'm poor. No, you're not compared to the rest, of the rest of the world. You're rich. So all these scriptures apply to us. Okay, It's not the rich man with all this wealth and land and corporations and all that stuff. It's the average guy who, who works a, a 9 to 5 or something, who's an entrepreneur, who's self-employed. We cannot chase riches and love money. It leads to sin, it leads to slavery, and it leads to us not being able to get, enter the kingdom of God because we can't serve God. Scripture is clear about all of this. Too many of us are still pursuing these things because we want, to, we want comfort and all this other stuff, and we don't believe that God can take care of us. And so, you know, we talked about that, how you will. Jesus has given us examples. Look, the lilies of the field, the birds, he's taking care of them. Why wouldn't he take care of you? Won't you just trust him? You know, rich folk, you know, it's time to begin to depart with that. <laughs> that great wealth of yours and begin to, you know, give that, give that away. You know, not to say it won't return, but to give it away and to begin to help those in need, especially the saints. That's what it's for. He said that will bring treasure in heaven. You see, now we specifically talking about needs. We're not saying you go give all your money to some church pastor who's already oh, well off. We're talking about those in need. Most of these pastors today, they will, they will preach a sermon like this and use these scriptures to, to, to guilt trip you into giving them all your wealth. We're not talking about that. A lot of these guys don't need anything. They need to be born again for the most part. But. We're talking about those in need. You know, let God lead you to give what you need to give to people and just start talking to them about your wealth. Say, God, I got all this wealth. I know you gave it to me to give it to help other people. How can how can I do that? And he'll he'll start laying on your heart things you can do. For those who have little, God will allow you to uh, help you to be content with what you have. You know, and even he's also the scriptures teach that he's given us the power to get wealth. Some of us need more money. And so God will give us the, the knowledge and the, and the resources to acquire more money. And of course, this is for the for the kingdom's sake. So until next time, you, you know, walk in the spirit. Allow God to lead you. And in, in, when it comes to finances. And just continue to hold on to the truth and that God is our provider. He takes care of us. He wants to get, bring us joy. He don't want us ch chasing happiness and, you know, little stuff that just is temporal. A lot of us got so much stuff in our house. All this stuff just jammed up from stuff we bought from commercials that we don't even use no more. It's just in the house. It's time for us to go and get all that, get rid of that stuff. Don't donate it to some charity or Give it to somebody that needs it and just walk off and get enlighten your load as far as your house is concerned, you know, and, and let go of this stuff because it, it's going to it's going to prevent us from getting into the kingdom. You don't want to stand before God having lost eternal salvation like the rich young ruler because I, I wanted to hold on to a few items.
Think about that. You in hell talking to somebody else, man. Why are you in here? I had some wealth. I didn't want to give it to the people in need. I was just too close to it. I didn't want to part with it. So now you got all eternity in torment for this. Look at the rich man in, in Lazarus. We read that at the beginning of this. This guy's in hell because he just didn't give, he didn't help out the old guy, the old, the, 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 the poor guy. He was just sitting there, his wounds, he, you know, dogs, he, all the man wanted was some scraps from the table. He didn't want to help him. We can't get arrogant with, with the money. You know, you can't let that money go to your head and think you're better than other people, you know? So that's what God is saying in scripture. It's not wrong to be rich. I'm not one of these people that teach that. Just do right with your finances and, and, and God will bless you with even more finances. So till next time, uh, walk in the spirit and be blessed.